Praise the Lord, people of God. It's my privilege to bring you the word today. And I believe I have a word from the Lord, a word that will motivate you, a word that will encourage you, a word that will help you to align for what the Lord has for you in this new season that we are just about to step in. Hallelujah. My, my word is called, Arise and Build, the Builder's Mantle. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we just bless your holy name. We just give thanks for a word from you. I ask, O oh Lord, that you speak through me in the name of Jesus. Let your words be the words that come out of my mouth. Father, encourage everyone that's hearing this word and encourage me too. And Lord, open the doors for us to step into a new season, pleasing you, doing your will, and walking according to purpose. So I thank you for breathing over this word in Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people said, Amen and Amen. Hallelujah. So arise and build the builder's mantle. You know, there are so many times that we want to do something or we think about something and it just looks like a huge problem. You know, we think about the solution and it looks like it's something that's going to take years and years, even generations and generations. And we start to lose hope. We start to, be dis to despair because we just can't see the end of that uh, problem. We can't see the solution happening anytime soon in our lifetimes. But people of God, we must believe in our God who is a supernatural God. He's a God of immense possibilities, immense power. Hallelujah. He's a God who lends his power to things and causes the most amazing things to happen, even in a short time, even amazing shifts. And therefore, as a people of God, we need to come before our God, hallelujah, align ourselves to him, see what's in his heart, and be willing to move with the anointing that he gives. There's a story in the Bible about a man named Nehemiah. And Nehemiah faced an improbable situation one could say an impossible situation of wanting to build the walls of faraway Jerusalem, which had broken down. It didn't look like anything that could happen. And yet the Bible records that in just 52 days, hallelujah, a man who was an exile, somebody who did not even have control over his own life, where he lives, where he goes, what he does, was able to have a dream and accomplish it completely in 52 days. This is the story of Nehemiah. I cannot finish it today, but we want to talk about the mantle and the anointing that must have come upon him to accomplish these things. Because this same mantle, the builder's mantle, is available for us today. Amen. Will you go with me to the book of um, Nehemiah? I'm just going to read these verses and talk about some of these verses as we go along. I'm going to read from Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. Let's hear the word of the Lord. These are the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakalia. Mm. It came to pass in the month of Chislev, in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan, the citadel, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came with men from Judah. And I asked him concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down and its gates are burned with fire. Amen. Amen. So this takes us to the Babylonian captivity where the Jews were held in captive in Babylon. And there were certain survivors that remained in Jerusalem. Certain ones who had escaped and certain ones who had been left behind. And so, of course, people who are in exile, they always think about the home country. And especially for the Jews who had a promise of that uh, land uh, where Jer Judea was, a, a land of Israel where they knew that God had given them this land. It was a precious possession. So for them to be away from the land, especially those whose hearts were towards the Lord, they would always think toward Jerusalem. Many would pray facing the east toward Jerusalem because of that great desire to return one day. So we find this man, Nehemiah, who has received guests, who has received travelers from Jerusalem, and he wants to know about what's happening there. Unfortunately for him, the news is not good. 
It's nowhere near good. And this is what he hears, that the people who have remained are in great distress and reproach. And then he hears the reason why, because the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are burned with fire. Hallelujah. You know, there are times of such distress, times of warfare, times of brokenness, even in individual human lives, when things have come against us, you know, it, right now in this season of COVID, things have come against our city, our country, even the whole world. And there's a lot of devastation from people dying to businesses, failing, and all kinds of things right now. We are not in a great place in the world. Hallelujah. So it's a time that we actually do think of rebuilding. In these scriptures, the problem is because of what? The walls that are broken and the gates which are burned. Evidently, walls are for protection and gates are for security and access. Okay, So it's all about who goes in and who comes out. It's all about safety. And all, also, all major transactions also occurred at the gates in those days. The gates in those days was the seat of parliament. It was the seat of the Chamber of Commerce. It was where everything important happened in those days. Amen. Let's take a look at what gates mean in the scriptures. In Isaiah chapter 60 and verse 18, we are thinking a bit about what gates and what walls mean in the scriptures. This is what it says. Violence shall no longer be heard in your land, neither wasting nor destruction within your borders. But you shall call your walls salvation and your gates praise. Hallelujah. You shall call your walls salvation and your gates praise. Amen. So you see, there is something that the walls are meant for. They are meant for salvation. Hallelujah. They are meant for sozo salvation. They are meant for the speaking of the word of salvation, bringing the lost in. They are meant for the people who know the Lord who have come in to remain saved, to remain um, to be delivered from oppressions, addictions, all sorts of issues. Uh, salvation is meant for people not to remain in poverty and brokenness. You know, it's meant for people to enjoy what the Lord has done for them and to thrive. Amen. Hallelujah. And gates are meant for praise. Okay. So where, when the walls are broken, it means that salvation Sozo salvation is broken. It means that souls are not being saved. Souls are lost in this world. And if they die, they will be lost in the hereafter. It means that people are unhealed in their bodies. It means that people are undelivered. They are living under oppressions. They are living bruised in this world. It means that they are living captive, unable to free themselves from addictions, from issues in this life. When the walls are broken, when salvation is broken, it means people have stunted growth. They cannot thrive. It means that they are captive. It means they are oppressed and they are unable to overcome. So that's what the broken walls also meant for Jerusalem. That people could not be safe. They could not be saved. They could not thrive. They could not overcome. They were oppressed and they were depressed. That's what it means. Amen. Hallelujah. There's a verse, Proverbs 25, 28, that says this. Whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls. Whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls. So you see that when our walls, even our walls of salvation, our internal walls of salvation, our individual walls of salvation, when they are broken and not intact, people have no rule over their own spirits. You find people doing all kinds of things that are detrimental to their own well-being. You find people getting so angry, frustrated, and causing their own marriages to break because of impatience because of anger. You find people who cannot control themselves and are bound to addictions like pornography. They are bound to drugs and all of these things and they may not even want to live like that and yet they have no control over their spirit and they are bound to something. So when we see things like that, we know that the walls are broken and as a society becomes more and more filled with such brokenness among people and people are not hearing the word of God and the word of God is not being preached and people are not being healed, then we begin to understand that the walls indeed are broken. Oh, and what a sad thing it is when the walls are broken, the walls of salvation. Hallelujah. Let's turn and look a little bit at what it means to have the gates burned, to have the gates burned. That's a serious thing too, because as I said before, 
Gates were where everything important happened. Gates were like the city of par the, the place of parliament at the time. It was like the chamber of commerce at the time. It was the place where, you know, they passed the civic rules, uh, uh, cultural rules, and all of those things. So the gates were very important. It was a place where important people were seated discussing issues. That was where the Senate was seated, really, discussing issues and making sure that they were making good judgments for the city. It was a place where uh, um, important people were celebrated. Yes, that is what happened at the gate. So what does God say about gates? In Psalm 100, we find an interesting perspective about gates. I'm just going to read 1 to 5 and pick a, a few scriptures there. This is what it says. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. Many of us know these psalm, this particular psalm. Most of us know it. Hallelujah. It is a psalm that brings us into the presence of God. And to get into the presence of God, we have to pass through the gates. Hallelujah. So the gates of the Lord that we pass through are gates of praise and thanksgiving. And praise and thanksgiving are found in a people in whom is the shout of the Lord and in whom is gladness. A whole people, a people who are together blessed, hallelujah, with wholeness, who enter into those gates to bless the Lord. You see, if we can't even enter into those gates, we can't even come before the Lord. So when we have a city with burned gates, we don't find worshipers. We don't have people praising the Lord. You know, we don't have people accessing the presence of the Lord and ascending into his presence. We don't have people doing that. And instead, because of that, the people cannot access the presence of God. They cannot access the power of God. And that remains a very vulnerable and very powerless people. So when they talk about the gates being burned, it's talking about not having an access into the presence of the Lord, not being able to tap into his presence and into his power. Hallelujah. So a burnt gate is a very serious thing. And you find that the gates are burned when fewer and fewer people are coming into the presence of God. When fewer and fewer people are going to church. When fewer and fewer people are not having their quiet time. When fewer and fewer people are not worshiping and praising the Lord. Then we find that the gates indeed are burned. So we don't have to have an invasion of an enemy before we have a burned gate. Spiritually, we can have burned gates and broken walls when we depart part from the living God. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Taking a look further at gates. Gates are where we find redemption. Hallelujah. When we go to Ruth chapter 4, hallelujah, I want to read a few verses from verse 1. This is what it says. Now Boaz went up to the gate and sat down there, and behold, the close relative of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, said, come aside, friend, sit down here. So he came aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. Then he said to the close relative, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, sold the piece of land which belonged to our brother Elimelech. And I thought to inform you, saying, Buy it back in the presence of the inhabitants and the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not redeem it, then tell me that I may know, for there is no one but you to redeem it, and I am next after you. So this is a picture of what happens at the gates. Important people sit at the gates. Witnesses sit at the gates. So when there are no gates, you find that there are no witnesses. And where are the witnesses of the Lord if we will not have a gate to sit by? So we find Boaz, hallelujah, and Boaz is calling for people, witnesses, and he's calling because he wants to do something. Boaz wants to redeem the losses of Naomi and Ruth, hallelujah, and bring them into the abundance of the Lord. He wants to bring them into the shalom of the Lord. He wants to bring them into the restoration of the Lord. He wants to bring them into the restitution of the Lord. So when gates are burned, people of God, there's no redemption. When gates are burned, there are no witnesses to observe what the Lord is doing. When the gates are burned, people of God, there is no restoration. When the gates are burned, there is no restitution. 
When the gates are burned, oh, it's a terrible, losses just become losses. Hallelujah. And it becomes a deep pit of loss and despair. That's why it's important for the gates to be replaced. Hallelujah. For the people of God to advance through the gates into the courts and the presence of the Lord, where all can be restored, restituted, where shalom can be found in Jesus' name. Again, I want to read Esther chapter 3 and verse 2. Because it talks about what else happens at the gates. You know, at the gates, there is what? Protocol. The voice of the king is upheld at the gates. Because people, noteworthy people, counselors, uh, uh, um, elders, they sit at the gates. And they inform the rest of the city about what is happening, what is being decreed in the king's palace. They talk about the laws, the rules, they judge matters, and so it's important for our gates to hold so that the Lord can judge matters on our account, so that we can hear the decrees that come in, that come in from the kingdom. Hallelujah, in the name of Jesus. So Esther chapter 3, I'm reading a few verses from verse 2, and it says, and all the king's servants who were within the king's gate, listen, they were within the king's gate. Servants are within the gate. Amen. They bowed and paid homage to Haman, for so the king had commanded concerning him. But Mordecai would not bow or pay homage. Then the king's servants who were within the king's gate said to Mordecai, why do you transgress the king's command? So I just want to tell you that there's a lot of protocol at the gates, and the gates are also where things are challenged. Hallelujah, things are challenged. You know, when there's an unrighteous law, it can be challenged at the gates. And Mordecai was challenging the bowing down to Haman at the very gates. It's a place of protocol. It's a place of rules. It's a place of righteous judgment. And it's a place where things which are unrighteous can be challenged. So it's a bad thing when there are no gates. And the laws that come out can be bad laws, and yet nobody can defend themselves against it. Nobody can stand up against it. That is why it's so important that the gates of any city, the gates of any people, the gates of the church must hold because it's, that's the place of righteous protocol and that's the place to stand up against that which is not right. Amen. So I think because of these things, we now have a sense of why it's so important when the walls are broken and when the gates are burned. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, something happens when the gates are, are burned and the walls are broken. It tells us that there is a big issue. There's a problem. When it happens in our individual lives, we can tell that there's a huge problem. When we have no rule over our souls, when anything is buffeting us left, right, and center, when we cannot stand, when our lives are spinning out of control, when we are making loss after loss, Oh, then we know that it's time for something to happen. And I want, you to I want to tell you today that that is the time that the Lord is willing to push the builder's mantle on anybody that wants to arise and build. So anybody that has in their heart that they want to arise and build, they look around them and they see a lot of things are falling. The walls are broken. The gates are burned in their city, in their nation, in their community, in their business, in their presence personal lives, in the lives of their children. And if such a person or such people have in their hearts that they want to arise and build, that is when the Lord will release the builder's mantle, which comes with an anointing. Hallelujah. It is so specific. It's so powerful. Hallelujah. It, uh, it can accomplish the improbable and the impossible in a short time. Hallelujah. So today I pray that there are people who are listening to me Hallelujah, who have in their hearts a desire to arise and build. I believe there are people who are listening to me today who have that desire to build their communities. They see that their countries have become corrupt. They see that there's too many poor people, too many sick people. They see that the healthcare system is broken. They see that there are unrighteous laws. They are looking around and seeing people suffering and such a people. They are calling out to the Lord. Hallelujah. They say, we want to arise and build. Lord, give us the builder's mantle. Amen. So let's hear what happened with Nehemiah, who was such a person. Hallelujah. Nehemiah chapter 1, I'm going to read now from verse 4. Hallelujah. This is what it says. So it was when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who you love, 
who love you and observe your commandments. Please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open, that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night, for the children of your of Israel your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel which we have sinned against you, both my father's house and I have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. So we find that when Nehemiah realizes there's a big problem, that will not be easily solved. When he realizes that the people are in reproach, distress, and shame, and that the walls are broken and the gates are burned, Nehemiah immediately begins to mourn. He begins to fast and cry out. People of God, there is a place for mourning in the house of God. There is a place for fasting in the house of God. There is a place for crying out in the house of God. There is a great place and a needed place called repentance in the house of God. Hallelujah, I just want to tell you that this repentance is one of the key uh, uh, foundational uh, um, doctrines that we have as a church. Hallelujah. It is God's way to turn us around. It is God's reset button. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. So be a believer that is willing to repent. Be a believer that is willing to hit the reset button and come to the Lord with humility. Yes, come to the Lord with fasting. Unfortunately, many believe today that because of the grace that is upon us, fasting is out of the door. It's unnecessary. But Believer, I want to tell you today that there is a place for fasting and a place for mourning, a place for fasting and mourning that attracts the attention of the Lord. Nehemiah was saying that, Lord, I am weeping before you. I am fasting before you. So therefore, open not only your ears to hear me, but turn your eyes on me. Give me, O oh Lord, your undivided attention. I want to say to you that fasting and mourning is a way to get the undivided attention of the Lord. Hallelujah. So if you've Try this and that. If you've been uh, working at it with your own strength and it's been failing, I want to suggest to you that you take a day or two or three, hallelujah, and sanctify a fast before the Lord and cry out from the pit of your heart and ask the Lord to hear your cry and turn his eye unto you and turn his ear towards you. Hallelujah. Hear your repentance. Hallelujah. And act and answer speedily in Jesus' name. So Nehemiah shows us the importance of repent repentance. How did he repent? He repented by identifying himself as a sinner. Yes, as a sinner. And saints, I know that you are saved by the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. You are a righteous saint. And yes, you can still have things that you repent about. You, you, you can still have things that you did and things that you didn't do that you need to repent about. Hallelujah. There are still things maybe in your home, in your father and mother's house. There are still things in your community, your city, among your people that you can repent about. And Nehemiah brought all of these things, identified himself with the problem and cried out to God in such a way that God could not turn his eyes and his ears away from Nehemiah. So if you really want him to hear you, sometimes, believer, sometimes, brother and sister, it's not just about asking, it's not just about praying, but sometimes it's about going the next level, hallelujah, to fast and to mourn before the Lord. I believe that the builder's mantle really comes with that spirit of repentance and that spirit of mourning before the Lord, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. So he prayed and he cried out. He reminded the Lord of certain things. Yes, he reminded the Lord of certain things. He spoke about um, scattering. This is what he said. I'll find that in, in, a, in a moment. He said, um, verse 8, remember I pray the word that you command, uh, commanded your servant Moses saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. Listen, people of God, the result of unfaithfulness is a scattering. Hallelujah. Uh, it, it's a scattering. It might not necessarily be that your whole nation is scattered among other nations, but you find that your life seems scattered. Your finances are scattered. Your children are scattered. Your family life is scattered. Oh, your business life can be scattered. Things have come in that have broken the cohesiveness of life and scattered it. It's so hard to gather things. It's so hard to find that place of stillness and shalom. And that's the result of unfaithfulness as Nehemiah has described according to the covenant that Moses wrote. And then he goes on to say that, but if you 
do repent. This is what happens in the same um, verse, verse 9. It says, yet I will gather them from there and bring them to the place which I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. So with repentance, God now goes after all that has been scattered. He goes over the relationships which have been broken and scattered. He goes back to the family that's broken. He goes to find where they are, however far they may be from each other. Because of repentance, the Lord will gather them together. Because of repentance, the, the Lord will gather a community together. He will gather a city together. He will bring them to oneness and unity. You know, sometimes, in, even in our politics, we can become so divided. Look at what is happening in the United States, where there's such a huge divide. It doesn't even feel like one country right now. But the Lord is saying, Saying that if they repent from unfaithfulness, he is going to what? Bring them. He's going to gather them together and bring them back and give them that spirit of unity. Hallelujah. And so it's not impossible, no matter how bad it looks. But the Lord says, if we return, if we repent, hallelujah, even with mourning and fasting, hallelujah, he will go after that which is scattered and bring it together again. He will gather it back together again. So if there's something missing in your life, if there's relationship broken in your your family. Hallelujah. Maybe it's time for you to turn to the Lord in repentance and to mourn and to fast and to call on this covenant and say, God, you said that if we are unfaithful, things will be scattered. But if we come back to you with repentance, you will gather everything that was scattered and bring it together again. Hallelujah. So this is a word for somebody out there who is suffering from a scattering. Hallelujah. That you will use that um, access of repentance to receive a a healing and a gathering in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is what Nehemiah did. He prayed, okay, he prayed. Now when we go to verse 11 and 11b, it's very interesting, 11b, what he said there. And this is what Nehemiah said at the end of his prayer. He said, let your servant prosper this day. Everybody hear this word. He didn't say let your servant prosper tomorrow. He said, let your servant prosper this day. Hallelujah. Nehemiah could see that there was a Kairos time that had come upon him. Hallelujah. He knew there was a Kairos time because what? There was a problem and he was a man that sought a solution from the bottom of his heart. He was a convicted man and a committed man. And I tell you, wherever God finds a convicted man and a committed man, hallelujah, he will provide a Kairos moment and that person can pray into that day and call it what? This day. Hallelujah. The delay is over. Now he's talking about about this day. Nehemiah said, let your servant prosper this day, I pray, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. Amen. This immediately reminds us of who uh, Nehemiah was. Nehemiah was an exile, but in an important position. He was the king's cupbearer. He was the one who tasted the wine to make sure there was no poison for the king. That meant that he was a trusted servant to the king. Amen. I want to suggest to you that we all have the position of a cupbearer to the Lord. Why? Because we can come close to the Lord. Why? Because we offer God our worship and our service. So if you are somebody that comes close to the Lord, that is practicing intimacy with the Lord, that is offering your worship and your service to the Lord, I suggest to you that you are a king's cup bearer. The Lord said, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. Hallelujah. So everyone is open to this position. Hallelujah. If only they will draw near to the Lord. Hallelujah. And so Nehemiah prayed, and, and he prayed for what? Mercy in the sight of this man. Indeed, he was praying for favor. Hallelujah. And I tell you, anybody that's intimate with the Lord has access to the favor of the Lord. It's impossible to be close to the Lord and not have favor. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. In the Bible, we see that God calls certain men. He said, a man after my own heart. He said of David. He called Abraham his friend. You know, anybody that takes the steps to walk with the Lord, I tell you, brothers and sisters, you will gain intimacy. Hallelujah. You will 
will be a friend of the Lord. And we can see the favor that was on Abraham's life and the favor that was on David's life. Hallelujah, in the name of Jesus. Everyone, this is open to whosoever will. Hallelujah. So Nehemiah tells us who he was. He said, I was the king's cupbearer. I suggest to you that the builder's anointing needs an intimate person to the Lord. The builder's mantle will come upon someone that is what? That is intimate with the Lord. The builder's anointing is going to come to somebody who is close and wants to hear what the Lord has to say. Somebody who has the favor of the Lord. Favor begins exactly where you stand. Favor, first with God, will give you favor with kings, and that will also give you favor with men. So, this is, we are talking now about the builder's mantle, hallelujah, and what it takes. We have just described the position of intimacy, hallelujah. We have just described the position of favor, hallelujah, favor with God, with kings, and with men. So, if you are somebody that is seeking this builder's anointing, that is seeking to bring an answer into your community, I suggest to you that you begin first by your repentance and your crying out to God, hallelujah, walk in intimacy with the Lord and begin to expect the favor of the Lord. Amen. Let's look at Nehemiah chapter 2. I'm going to read from verse 2. And this is what it says. Amen. And it came to pass in the month of Nisan, in the twentieth year of King Atta Exerces, when wine was before him, that I took the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had never been sad in his presence before. Therefore the king said to me, Why is your face sad, since you are not sick? This is nothing but sorrow of heart. So I became dreadfully afraid and said to the king, May the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs, lies waste and its gates are burned with fire? Then the king said to me, what do you request? Amen. I wanted to say to you, child of God, your favor begins exactly where you stand. It begins exactly where you stand with the Lord and exactly where you stand with men. Hallelujah. Exactly in that position where you stand, first before the Lord and then before men, your favor begins from there. And if you have a commitment and a conviction to do the will of God, you will have an opportunity, hallelujah, to speak your request to the Lord. You will have an opportunity to speak your request to men. You will have the opportunity to speak your vision out, hallelujah, exactly where you stand in intimacy with the Lord, hallelujah. And before men, you will have that opportunity to speak your request, hallelujah, praise God. Amen. So in that place where we stand, we find Nehemiah in service. So you, child of God, be a person of service. Be a person of excellent service. Hallelujah. Be a person that uh, there's a testimony about how you work, how you how you you are serviceable, how you worship the Lord. Build um, such a testimony about yourself. Hallelujah. That people are interested in what is happening with you. Now, Nehemiah, he served the king all the time. Probably he served him with a smile. So on this day, as he stood fasting, as he stood sorrowing, the king was able to detect something different, and God prompted him to ask Nehemiah what the issue was. I want to say to you, anybody with a builder's uh, a desire to be a builder for the Lord, anybody who's desiring the builder's mantle, be a person of excellence. Be excellent in your worship with the Lord. Be excellent in your service with the Lord. Be excellent at your daily job. Be excellent in your family. Be excellent, hallelujah, in the name of Jesus, that God can lay, hallelujah, something on somebody's heart. To see your vision through in Jesus' name. What do you request? So today, if the, somebody was to ask you, what do you request? What would be on your heart and mind? If the Lord was to ask you today, what do you request? What would be upon your heart? Would it be a job? Would it be a house? Would it be a spouse? What kind of request would you have? People of God, sometimes we are so invested in only our personal needs. 
Many a times we come before the Lord and all we are crying about is only what concerns us. I want to tell you today, if you have a builder's desire, if you are seeking the builder's mantle, you have to be somebody that looks outward to the needs of the community. You have to be somebody that looks outward, hallelujah, and high upon God and to ask what is upon his heart, hallelujah. Such a person is deserving before the Lord of a builder's mantle, hallelujah, in Jesus' name. What do you request? Amen. Praise God. Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 4 says, So I prayed to the God of heaven and I said to the king, If it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. Oh, people of God, just take a look at this. The man said what? Send me. Hallelujah. Can you take a moment and say to the Lord, send me, hallelujah. Can you take a moment and mean it from your heart? Send me, hallelujah. This reminds me of Isaiah when he saw the Lord high and lifted up and the Lord said, who will go for us? Isaiah said, send me, hallelujah. The Lord is looking for those who will say, send me. The Lord is looking for those who are willing to go on a mission, hallelujah, in the name of Jesus. And he said, send me that I may what? rebuild. Everybody say rebuild. Hallelujah. The Lord wants us to rebuild the broken walls of our lives. He wants us to rebuild the burnt gates of our lives. The Lord wants us to rebuild the broken walls of our family's lives. He wants us to rebuild the burnt gates of our family lives. The Lord wants us to rebuild the broken walls of our cities and communities, our nation. He wants us to rebuild the burnt gates. Hallelujah. And he's looking for someone to say, send me that I may rebuild it. Hallelujah. Now the person who says, send me that I may rebuild it is that person who is looking for the builder's mantle. That person is looking for the mandate. That person is looking for the mission, the sending, hallelujah. And that person is looking to have an activated set time, an activated set time, hallelujah, in the name of Jesus. Nehemiah was talking about what? This day, hallelujah. He wasn't talking about 10 years later. He wasn't talking about when I retire from my job. He wasn't talking about, you know, when my kids grow up. Nehemiah, who was seeking the builder's mantle, was looking at what? This day. And I say to you, anybody that is looking for that builder's mantle must be ready this day, hallelujah, to do the will of the Lord. Hallelujah. Verse 6 says, Then the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, How long will your journey be, and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. Listen, listen. He said, I set him a time. He said, I set him a time. Hallelujah. Now, there was an activated set time. Nehemiah set a time. And he wasn't setting it in five years or in ten years. He was saying, I'm just about to go, Lord, my Lord, my King, and I'm going to return on a certain day. I want to tell you that this builder's mantle will give you an activated set time. Hallelujah. And the time is now. Hallelujah. It's a Kairos moment and a Kairos opportunity. It does not wait for you. Hallelujah. When the gates, the ports are open, you've got to be ready to move right at that time. That is what the builder's mantle does to anyone that's calling for it. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 7. And I'm reading. Furthermore, I said to the king, if it pleases the king... Let letters be given to me for the governors of the region beyond the river, that they must permit me to pass through till I come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he must give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel, which pertain to the temple for the city wall, for the house that I will occupy. And the king granted them to me according to the good hand of my God upon me. Amen. Praise God. You know, the builder's mantle, it comes with a certain anointing. And that anointing will bring what we call destiny helpers. It will bring what we call favorable gatekeepers. And it will bring resources. Hallelujah. The builder's mantle comes with very powerful anointings. And some of these anointings are going to bring you destiny helpers. They are going to bring you favorable gatekeepers. And they are going to bring you resources. And all of these things within an activated set time. As I said before, this anointing is not going to wait for you five years, ten years. The Kairos opportunity has come. The gates are opened. Hallelujah. And the Lord is going to answer prayer by giving destiny helpers, 
favorable gatekeepers and resources. And so Nehemiah asked for these things. Now I'm saying to you, if you're a person with a builder's mantle, hallelujah, spend some time to pray to God and ask for those destiny helpers, ask for favorable gatekeepers and ask for the resources. This is an anointing that depends heavily on God. You cannot do it in your own strength. You cannot do it with just your own planning. Hallelujah. You got to depend on God. Hallelujah. To move within the anointing that this mantle carries in Jesus' name. And so the scripture tells us that he asked, and according to Nehemiah, the king granted them to me. Hallelujah. According to the good hand of my God upon me. And he explains that the reason why he was granted everything he asked was because of the good hand of God upon him. People, we can't do things without God. So many of us have good plans, good ideas. Sometimes we are carried away by compassion. We want to do this for that person, but we don't wait on God. We don't ask God. We don't really depend on him. We just depend on our own ability to do good works. But Nehemiah said that these resources came because of the good hand of his God that was upon him and because he asked. Prayer is so important, people. We need to ask the Lord for our needs. We need to come to him, hallelujah, and not just, you know, flow in our own strength. The, you know, somebody said the commission is a co-mission, the commission is a co-mission. You know, when he commissions us, it's not for us to just run ahead and try and get every, everything done, you know, come and wrestle people, wrestle resources. No, it's a co-mission. He's walking with you in this builder's mantle, hallelujah, to cause you to build in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Praise God. So let's look at what happens in Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 9. This is what he said. Then I went to the governors in the region beyond the river, and gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent captains of the army and horsemen with me. When Sambalat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard of it, they were deeply disturbed that a man had come to seek the well-being of the children of Israel. Oh, he went to the governors and then he found this opposition. Oh, when he got there, there was opposition. People of God... You know, when, the fact that we are doing the right thing doesn't mean that we will not have opposition. In fact, every move of God will be opposed by the enemy. You know, many a times, children of God are so shocked when they meet opposition. They are so disturbed, they, they despair, you know, they give up just because they meet opposition. But as people of God, we have to expect that there will be opposition when we want to accomplish the will of God in our lives. There will be opposition. We have to be a people that develop that kind of a spiritual backbone to resist the despair when we meet uh, opposition, when we meet hindrances, when we meet resistances. We have to be a people that learn how to encourage ourselves throughout the Bible. We find people who were being challenged whilst they were in righteous mission. So I say to you, do not give up because things have come up against the mission. I say to you, do not give up. Do what um, Nehemiah would have done. Hallelujah. So we realize that this builder's mantle comes with a certain challenge to it. Therefore, people who are wanting to build in the name of the Lord have to be a people of prayer. They have to be a people who are adept at supplications and intercessions. They have to be a people that um, participate in the priesthood that Christ has given us on earth. Hallelujah. So we've got to pray. And so what would he have prayed for? You know, he, even as we read, he was what? Praying for what? Safe passage. He was praying for safe passage. He asked the Lord to give him letters. He said, give me letters. Give me letters. Give me uh, uh, something with your stamp, your seal on it. You know, we have to wait on the Lord for that commission. We have to ask him, commission me. Give me your authority. We've got to ask for the authority of the Lord. We've got to be invested by his authority. Hallelujah. And we can do this through prayer in the name of Jesus. Nehemiah said, I went to the governors in the region before the river and gave them the king's letters. We must have that authority. Hallelujah. To move by in the name of Jesus. He said, the king had sent captains of the army and horsemen with me. We've got to pray. Hallelujah and believe God, hallelujah, for the protection that he alone will give us. Amen. He said, the king has sent captains of the army and horsemen with me. So also can we pray for angelic help, angelic protection in the name of Jesus. We can pray for safe passage. Nehemiah had to go through various lands and territories, and many of these would have been hostile to him. But because he had prayed for safe passage, he had 
had, what, captains of the army and horsemen with him. You also, child of God, ask for that safe passage. Ask for the angelic uh, 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 contingent that the Lord will give you for your safety in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. You know, because we have opposition. We have to expect opposition. Amen. And we have to be prayed up against opposition. We have to be prepared against opposition. Many of us don't pray. As soon as we have a good idea, we just run along with it. We don't pray in advance. We don't pray during. We don't pray as we are walking through these things. We are walking as if we don't have an enemy. We are walking as if there aren't plots and schemes and plans of the devil against us. Oh, but we have to become a people of that priesthood, a people who walk in the authority of the living God and are people who are prayed up, hallelujah, and have safe passage, hallelujah, and protection against hostile agents, hallelujah, in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, people of God, I just want you to consider this builder's mantle. We are by no means near the end of Nehemiah, and I'm hoping I'll be back in a, a couple of weeks to, to finish this uh, sermon with the second part. But for this first part, I'm talking about the builder's mantle. I know that the Lord is looking for builders to rise. He is looking for rebuilders all across this world. Hallelujah. There's so much that's wrong in our, in our cities, in our own lives, in our communities right now, in our families. You know, we see the problems and we talk about them. Some of us have become so good at talking about them. In fact, we love to talk about these issues. We, we can only be three or four or five and we put the politics of the day at hand and we criticize everybody from the premier hallelujah all the way through the government we poke fingers and we talk about them and we talk about issues but we are not ready to do anything about it my friends, we the people of God are called to be solution finders. We are God's solution to a broken world. The Bible calls us what? The salt and the light of this world. We are the ones that um, bring what preserves community. We are the ones that show the way. Hallelujah. And the Lord is looking for us not to become talkers, not to become memorers, not to become complainers, not to become fault finders, but he's looking for us to have a conviction, hallelujah, and a desire to, for his will to be done on earth as we pray in the Lord's prayer. He is looking for a people that want to rise up and say send me Lord that I may go and rebuild. He is looking for a people who will say this day Lord send me. He is looking for a people who will say I am fasting and mourning Lord until you give me an opportunity to solve this problem. The Lord his eyes are scanning. The Bible says he is looking for those whose hearts are faithful to strengthen them. Are you one of these, my friend. We have such an opportunity in this world. This opportunity will not be there for us in heaven, which is a perfect place. But in this place where there is brokenness, we have the opportunity to serve in a great way. We have an opportunity to serve God even in the little ways. Even in the little ways, God sees greatness in those little ways. So I say to you today, just rise up, become a builder, have a desire for the builder's mantle, and begin to challenge for it. Begin to work through repentance and crying out and explaining the problem and showing to God that your heart is ready to move with him and I know that he will invest you with exactly what he invested Nehemiah with. He will give you favor as he gave Nehemiah favor before the king. He will give you what? He will have, he will give you resources. He will give you destiny helpers. He will give you favorable gatekeepers. He will give you safe passage. He will give you protection. Hallelujah. He will give you everything you need to accomplish a mission that would have seemed impossible. Hallelujah. And like Nehemiah, you will shock yourself when you accomplish that mission in just a few weeks. Hallelujah. Remember this, my brothers and sisters. Romans chapter 8 verse 18 says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Many of us are crying because of sufferings of this present time. Many of us are depressed because of sufferings of this present time. Oh, many of us are sad. But the Bible tells us here that that suffering is not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed in us. Brothers and sisters, there is a glory to be revealed in us. 
And that glory comes as we rise up as builders. Hallelujah. Verse 19 says, For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. All that is broken is waiting for us to be revealed. Hallelujah. It's waiting for us to adopt the mantle of the builder. It's waiting for us to be convicted. Hallelujah. To receive a plan from God and to move under unction. Hallelujah. To bring solutions to our communities and our societies. So I say to you, child of God, today, if you have heard this and you've been complaining in your heart about issues in your country, in your city, and you've been complaining about corruption, and you've been complaining about the healthcare system, and you've been complaining about this and that, I say to you, child of God, now is the time to turn to God, hallelujah, and ask him for the builder's mantle. In Jesus' name, hallelujah, amen, amen. I want to lead us in prayer. I want to lead us in prayer, hallelujah, at this time in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. My Lord and my God, I believe that there are people out there who will seek this builder's mantle. I put out an altar call for them at this time in the name of Jesus. The people who want to say, here am I, send me. Send me to rebuild, Lord, and I will do it in Jesus' name. And so I send this call out. If you are such a person right now, I just want you to begin to pray with me in the name of Jesus. Lord, I just lift up all people that you have called as builders. I know that the call goes out to many, but according to your word, many are called, but few are chosen. I pray that today many will qualify themselves, hallelujah, by choosing themselves to be a part of your rebuilders in our lives, in our society, in our generation at this time. I pray, Father, that you invest them with a spirit of repentance, a spirit, O oh God, of sorrow, and a spirit of prayer in the name of Jesus, that they may be able to cry out concerning the specific areas that you have called them to be burdened with, that they will be willing to carry the burden of prayer in the name of Jesus, and even mourn and fast before you, hallelujah, until, Father, your eyes and your ears are turned to them, hallelujah, and you you will uh, create a Kairos opportunity for them in the name of Jesus Christ. I pray that wherever they stand today, they may find the favor of God. I pray that wherever they stand today, they may find the favor of kings and the favor of men. I pray in the name of Jesus that wherever they stand today, that the word will come to them what do you request? And Lord, I pray that as that question comes, the vision and the purpose will be clear to them and they'll be able to speak it clearly. Just like um, it's written in the book of Habakkuk, write the vision and make it plain. Hallelujah, that he may run who reads it. Hallelujah, in the name of Jesus Christ. I know the fasting and the mourning and the crying out will sharpen the vision for these people. In the name of Jesus, you will make it clear. And I pray, Father, Lord God, uh, that they will have the boldness to ask for the reason resources that is needed. The destiny helpers, hallelujah, and the favorable gatekeepers. And I pray, Father, that you will supply that in the name of Jesus, Father, it will be so abundant upon them in the name of Jesus. They will have resources of the human kind and resources of the financial and material kind. Hallelujah. They will be well resourced, hallelujah, with destiny helpers and favorable gatekeepers. And Father, as they walk this path in the name of Jesus, I pray that you will also send captains of angels with them in the name of Jesus to provide them protection, hallelujah, and safe passage. And Father, as they step up into this uh, calling at this time, they will feel the mantle that Nehemiah had fall upon them. The builder's mantle will come upon them and they will be willing to go here and there to do your purposes. Some will be willing to go to villages and uh, and cities. Some will be willing to go into schools and hospitals. Some will be willing to go into media and the arts. Some will be, able, will be willing to help little children, teens. Hallelujah. Some will be willing to help governments in the mighty name of Jesus. Some will be willing to bring unity, hallelujah, and peace into their community. Some of them, oh God, will be willing to work with social justice, Lord. And through all of this, hallelujah, we will bear testimony that we are the children of the Most High God. We are not just the children, but the mature sons of God. Hallelujah. Because your word declares that all of creation is waiting with expectation that we will be revealed. Hallelujah. In the places of our calling. Hallelujah. Doing the works of God and accomplishing your purposes. Hallelujah. In our lifetime that the many may be saved. Hallelujah. Unto eternal life. So I thank you today for this word. Hallelujah. In Jesus name. 
I also want to send out an altar call if you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ. You are missing a lot. Oh, you are missing a lot if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. You may never find that purpose. You may never find that builder's purpose. You might find yourself building what you shouldn't be building. So today I say to you that if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, just open your heart. Hallelujah. And just pray with me. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Say, Lord, I need you. Lord, I realize that I'm a sinner. And Lord, I just repent of my sins. Thank you for the reset button we have in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. That the blood of Jesus will cleanse our sins and make us pure. He will give us his robe of righteousness and we can stand before you. Father, I want to be counted as a child of the living God. I want to be counted as saved. I want to have an eternal home in heaven. Hallelujah. And I want to fulfill my purpose in Christ Jesus. If you have prayed this prayer today, why don't you um, email River of Life? or find a good church near you, tell somebody, hallelujah, and begin the walk of discipleship. And very soon, you too may receive a builder's mantle, hallelujah, to accomplish purpose in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Can we all just say a big and resounding amen. Hallelujah. God is good all the time, and we are blessed to be his children. Amen and amen.